Hey, BDE, welcome everybody. We're fortunate today to have our guest, Avery Plank. Avery, thanks Chuck, for how are joining you? us. Absolutely. Colin, Colin is out on a call as we speak with the IRS contesting the fact that prostate exams should be tax deductible. We'll let, we'll let you know how that goes. But uh, anyway, Avery, you're here on a big day. One, you're here. That's cool. Number two, Mark Meyer has launched BDE Sidetrack. Lay it on us, Mark. What's that? Uh, just launched on Collide, first entry to a blog that's really going to take things in focus for BDE um, and, and really just explore a little bit deeper about how we think about certain issues. This first one is on what, I, what I've titled Drill Baby Drill versus Dig Baby Dig, talking about the relative positions on energy policy, at least as manifest in the, in the, in the platforms, uh, where does sidetrack come from? In my early analyst days, uh, the late great Mike Fraser, who was the founder of the securities group at Simmons and company and, and famous for tagging nicknames. Um, I tend to be a little bit of a nonlinear thinker if it's not already obvious. And so in, uh, in those sales and trading discussions as a research analyst, um, trying to connect multiple somewhat nuanced thoughts together seemed to be a bit tangential. I tend to like to think of it as nonlinear thinking. It's kind of a complex world. And so um, that's the name. There's no scheduled frequency, but it'll be a regular, a regular post. And, and so we'll talk about things that are of interest to us and how we think about them and hopefully get, um, some, some deeper, um, analysis out there in terms of the things that we, we touch on, on, on regular BDE. So collide again is digital wildcatters knowledge share app, sign up at collide.io logging in there on the desktops, the best way to use the app. You got the collide GPT there, the video search engine, the forum where you can talk. And that's where Mark posted, I think we've got 20,000 job listings on it. We've also got the I, the app that has, I think, 75, 80% of that functionality, 100% functionality is coming to the, uh, to the app soon. So that's cool. Uh, and by the way, I actually read it. I thought it was really good. Everybody should read that. Um, and it's policy, not politics. Yeah, exactly. In the, in the context of Let's, uh, 2024 election, there's a political... Uh, restriction on on collide as there should be. Yes, I I, I enjoy having my girlfriend. I would like to keep her. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was compelled to get it out sooner as opposed to later when I saw uh, Tehana Brown tweeted something over the weekend, and I'm paraphrasing something about you know please let's not return to drill baby drill. Yeah, and our observations around that slogan and kind of what what's reality for the upstream industry, particularly in the U S after what we've been through for the last, well, since 2014. Um, Cause it kind of points out that, well, John Arnold too, right over a week ago also was, was made the same point that, you know, is this really where the upstream guys should be putting their money into the drill baby drill policy? And you know, what was interesting about John's point, cause I kind of tagged back on it was he said, Okay, you have better legislation, more easily, more easily uh, able to drill. You'll just drill more, more production, drop your price, and destroy your economics. I think it was way more investor driven. Investors wanted production growth, and that's what led to drill, baby, drill versus the law. I think even if you free up the rules and regulations and all. Without investors saying go go go, I'm not sure we see the the flood in production like John maybe is is implying. Yeah, I, when I covered the group, vast majority of my career covering the NP sector, the sector on a on a total basis routinely outspent discretionary cash flow to the tune of fifteen to twenty percent or more, uh, a lot more. So it, you know, we're not anywhere near that now. And I don't think we're going back, but the point really is, is that a political or government exhortation in the U S to drill more 
flies completely in the face of the framework that ENP management teams and boards, uh, both private and publicly traded, are operating under where they're meeting the demand of their primary stakeholders, which are their owner shareholders. Yeah. And, you know, we we might move the portfolio puzzle pieces around a little bit if there's more um, federal access, but on balance, there's, you know, we're not going to see this step change, not saying that at least within our orbit, we believe that drill baby drill is a a literal um, command to, to return to the exalted from all on high to what, (laughs) to what, uh, quip master and legendary XTO founder, Bob Simpson used to characterize the behavior of his more profligate competitors as growing for sport. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I think that's right. And this was funny. So when I texted Avery and said, Hey, will you come join us? Cause Kirk and Colin are both out. Avery was like, yes, but I want to talk about one thing and that's Trump's infrastructure. Knock us out. So I am an infrastructure guy. So as Chuck knows, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the pipeline side of the business have been for a long time. Um, I think there's been this misnomer, this, this misunderstanding that when Republicans are in, they just make things super easy. Um, that's not, that has not been the case on, on the infrastructure side. The headlines make it that way, right? You had Keystone XL get pushed through with Trump and then immediately killed with, with Biden. So you get, you see the big headlines. Burke has been incredibly better under, and, and when I say better, been quicker to get things through under Obama and under Biden than Trump. Trump had more than twice as long between when something got uh, put to the FERC to when it got approved. Uh, and part of that is just, Trump just never got people in to the, to the FERC um, and the newer version of FERC. And I mean, the newest commissioners under Biden have actually done a really good job of getting back to just getting things done. They've even come back and said, our job is not to do greenhouse gas. It's to actually look at projects, see if they work, move them forward. So I always get a little you know, suspicious with some of my colleagues who are like, I can't wait for Trump. It's going to make things so easy. I'm like, nah, that's not, that's not necessarily the case. It was, it was interesting. So I moderated a fireside chat with Mary Madeline and James Carville mm-hmm. for uh, the Latham Watkins Energy Conference. And this can be a pro-Trump statement. It can also be an anti-Trump statement. One of the points Mary Madeline made is that back in 2016, no one expected Trump to win. Right. And so traditionally what happens is each side's think tanks are vetting people the year coming into an election. And so if you look at the heritage foundation, all those type of folks, nobody was vetting appointees for, uh, for Trump cause they didn't think he was going to win. So he right. got into office and he couldn't install people. And so you're saying that about the FERC makes a lot of sense. The, Pro, so the so the anti-Trump message in that, which because everybody says, oh, Trump's going to do all these bad things, and I say, well, name when he did them in four years. The one legitimate argument to that is this time he's going to hit the ground running. He's going to have his people in. There will be you know? some of that, right? I and, mean, and, the, and good, the good thing is, I shouldn't say good, but right. So the FERC is bipartisan. You can't have more than three. It's five members that are commissioners. You can't have more than three from any one party. Um, and you've seen, they've, they've done a much better job in the last two years of, of actually you know, sticking to their task. I think one thing that it will be interesting to see, right. Is you have had some of the Trump supporters, specifically the project 2025 folks, right. Saying that they want to get rid of FERC, get rid of the FEC or FCC, um, and just get, get that totally off the table. Pluses and minuses as a you know long time small government guy, I would love to see that, but I also realize that you have to have somebody looking at these projects, right? So that's just that's just an issue. So 
Yeah, I mean, but, it almost kind of rolls back into the to the the Chevron deference decision at the bingo. Supreme Court, as well as you know, it kind of rolls back into ultimately, does the Commerce Clause just trump everything, every issue out there? I.e., the Feds get to weigh in on it. Yeah, know? I mean, in, right. So and that's so, that's another misnomer, right? So all the crude pipelines are all interstate commerce issues, right? It's the gas pipelines that are FERC. So those are two different groups. And obviously LNG facilities are under FERC. Um, so I think, I think you'll see some issues there. I think the, the other thing that will be interesting to see is, you know, are we going to have just some sort of massive step change in how these things get approved? No. I mean, that, that's been my big thing to my, you know, any, any friends of mine in the, in the pipeline business, I'm like, this isn't going to get massively easier. Uh, it doesn't change anything like the energy transfer issues that you're seeing all the, all the legal issues they're having in Louisiana. Just, you know, that's a, you know, you need an attorney in here to talk about why Louisiana law is vastly different than Texas law. That's a whole nother side bar. But so, you know, the inter intrastate pipelines will still have their, their issues, but you know, the MVPs of the world and some of those projects will, I, they're not going to get, any easier than they were. If anything, it might get harder if he holds up putting people in positions again. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, it'll be interesting to watch. But a big part of the inertia was those uh, commissioner seats being vacant. That was for, that was a big part. Absolutely. Yeah, protracted they were period, two right? they were two two for a long time and wasn't it? And then it He didn't have a quorum. He didn't have a quorum. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh and then by we because we reported on this on on BDE, um, Biden came in, appointed the third. They changed the rules, and the big fear was that was game changing, shutting down the rules. And at least the headlines have been it's been really bad. But you're saying as a practical matter, it was better. So his original, I'm trying to remember, it's Glick was the original sort of head of FERC. Right. He he was just as slow as what was under. Trump. They brought in Phillips, who was, was the new commissioner or head of FERC, really shrunk the time down and moved things much, much quicker. And now they have even newer commissioners in that they just had a um, hearing, what was it, last week, I think. And, th and they, they were really interesting to me. If you listen to what they said about, they said, look, our job is not to be the CO2 watchdog. It's to make sure the lights stay on and make sure that power gets power and energy gets to the people, which was a really interesting. And that was from both sides, by the way, which I thought was, that was to me a big step change, even from the Democrats. Well, cause, cause when Biden appointed Phillips and they went three, two, I think. Yes. Um, they changed the rulemaking so that uh, emissions had to be considered. And it was, Correct. The, it was the first rule change in 21 years and it was it, it that was at least used to shut down Mountain Valley. So there was a fear that what you just said was, was not going to be the mm -hmm. case. So it's it's mm -hmm. actually good to hear because of all the things I follow in this world, FERC's not one of them. <laughs> yeah, and there's really not there. If you want to follow FERC, there are people to follow. Don't follow FERC themselves. So uh, yeah. yeah. And you've uh, had some uh, of them. FERC off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good way to put it. All right, Mark, what happened in Venezuela? Oh, boy. An election yesterday, presidential election, much anticipated. Should, should you put that in air quotes? <laughs> it's all in air quotes. Oh, okay. Got it. And so um, I guess overnight, some of the news showed exit polling and other observers suggesting that uh, Maduro's opposition um, or his opponent, Edmundo Gonzalez, who's a 74-year-old former diplomat, um, he was actually running in front of the opposition leader who has been banned from participating as a candidate, um, last name Machado. And so the, the exit polling and observations were suggesting that Gonzalez was garnering as much as 65% of the vote and Maduro was as low as mid-teens. But this morning, or late yesterday, um, Maduro essentially came out and declared himself the winner. And in the 
you know, where's Venezuela been in the last 25 years uh, since Chavez came to power in 1999? As recently as 1992, Venezuela was the third richest country in the Western Hemisphere. When Chavez came to power in 1999, the country produced 3.2 million barrels a day. Today, for various reasons, it's down to 800,000 barrels a day. Now, I've seen some things, well, you know, if we get some loosening of sanctions, if we get uh, more clarity on participation by um, former international partners, there's a couple hundred thousand barrels a day that no one really knows. And most importantly, over this last 25 years, and it has accelerated in the later years of Maduro's regime, you've had 7 million people leave the country. Including emptying their jails and sending them here. I, I know Trump says that, and there are some questions as to whether that is truly happening. But there, there, there are a lot of respected re, uh, sources saying, yes. They've dumped their mental institutions and their, uh, their criminals. Yeah. And so, you know, in, in the old world of murky geopolitics and geopolitical risk and events driving that, um, there used to be a, a risk premium that would show up immediately in crude. It's actually down. I was going to say, it hasn't done much. Well, a couple of percent between that and the, uh, and one of y'all two on. just hit on the importance of Venezuelan crude because I don't think a lot of people realize it's the heavier stuff that our refineries need. Well, right? the whole redesign or the retrofit of the U.S. Gulf Coast refining system back in the early to mid 2000s, billions spent to handle heavy sour. And that's essentially what Ven crude is. Now, the shale. Miracle flip all that on its head. But yeah, it was, it was a primary source of what Gulf Coast refiners thought the future of, and the world thought the future of a feedstock was going to be. So. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to replace here, right? I mean, there's very few large basins that have it. I mean, couple of offshore basins, right? Mars crude is, it's about as close as you can get and it's still way off. So, you know, it's, it's going to be, and then, and then you've got TMX taking heavy Canadian West. So, um, you know, friends of mine in the refining business were like, oh, it's great. It's more, more problems for us. So, but we'll see. But, uh, you know, there was a, there was actually a call in the middle of COVID where, the Department of Energy reached out to uh, some people and said, hey, if we got to go spend a lot of dollars, what do we do? And Jake actually proposed on a call, let's retrofit all of the Gulf Coast refineries to run off the light sweet crude from U.S. shale. And he got told to go jump in a lake. But anyway, I, I, it's it's – it's fascinating when you think of, of refineries that you, you can't just run a barrel of oil through it. It's got to be a certain mix and certain outcomes and efficiencies, et cetera, require yeah, I mean, a that's, certain that's what you hit on. You, you can run it. It's yeah. just not going to give you what you want, right? Yeah, you're it's, not going to make any money. Yeah, it's, 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 it's putting lower so, octane <laughs> gasoline in your, you know, in your Ferrari. I, I think one thing that may be left undone on the bucket list of places to visit is Venezuela. Um, my wife was born an expat there a long time ago before yeah, the the nationalization waves and then ultimately um been close but not have not been able to visit. So Let's, I have one real quick on, yeah. on the, the one thing I've so I work for a company that's in the Hess building, okay? Who is getting bought by Exxon or Chevron, excuse me. We'll see. If, if yeah, we'll see. So if you're Chevron or Hess. And you see this, you know, does this give you a little more heartburn? Because there's always in the back of their mind that Venezuela just takes over that part of the world. Because, yeah. by the way, if you go to look at a map in Venezuela, Ghana's not on there. That's, that's Venezuela. Right. Yeah. And They're like, oh, everything west of mine. the Esquiba River. So it's the Esquiva, yeah. Esquiva province. We've talked about that when there so, were starting to be troop movements on, on the border. 
And, you know, does this kind of wash, rinse, repeat yeah. <laughs> of Maduro's elections, air quotes, does this push the friction higher and the reaction to that? I mean, Maduro's firmly in control of the military, right. which is, I guess, been part of the problem in terms of uh, being able to have a real those free and yeah. fair elections. I saw, you know, footage and, and pictures from some of the, uh, the polling locations. And there was, there were a lot of firearms being brandished by uniform guys. So, um, Millet, Argentina's populist president was hypercritical. He was one of the first to, mm-hmm. um, suggest that it was illegitimate and, you know, we'll, we'll see where the kind of the wedge between uh, Venezuela or Maduro's detractors internationally goes, but well, and we get, I, I don't, I don't think it heads in a good direction from here. Yeah. Well, and we got a lot to talk to. So let's, let's take this as the exit question on this issue and be brief on it. I mean, obviously, obviously not good for continued oil production in Venezuela. Obviously the Guyana issue rears its ugly head. Um, what do we actually do about this? Because at the end of the day, we, we lessen sanctions in exchange for a free election. That didn't work. What, what do we do? And is there anything that actually can be done? I have no idea. Just yeah. a pipeline guy. I mean, what yeah. am I? Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. No, the, and I mean, cause the thing I always hate about sanctions is it hurts people and you know, yeah. I mean, you can arguably make a case that sanctions worked in South Africa, but it was a heavy price for a lot of people and the people you were trying to help with the, the embargoes. And so it's, I, I you're, you're a pipeline guy. I'm a podcaster, so I have no idea. I mean, you've got significant U S interests in Guyana, in the Guyana basin and certainly the Staybrook block. And, and I, you know, I, I think we'll continue to, to try this diplomatic containment, but given how far Venezuela has spiraled and how prominent this is, um, it's, it's near neighbors are, going to be more vocal. Right. I hope it doesn't have to come to this, but in the face of all this evidence that the opposition was, was favored. Most Venezuelans are kind of tired of the last 25 years. It's a whole generation. You know, those things typically end in in a, in a not nonviolent way. That's right. The, the, The girlfriend made the point this morning that there was an uneasy detente between the business leaders and Maduro. Um, does this break that? You know, because if internal pressure could come, it's coming from the business interests within Venezuela. So that's right. To be seen. All right. So you know what's funny is I think if we look at the remaining run of show, it's kind of like the greatest folly hits of renewable energy. <laughs> that wasn't intentional. So, yes. So, uh, Mark, you want to fire away? Avery, you want to fire away? Who level sets us on on those those acts? Well, we had a um, we had an overturn semi on the I fifteen, which connects about the only artery that connects Los Angeles with Las Vegas, carrying estimated 75,000 pounds of lithium batteries, which then caught fire and shut down the freeway for several hours. In fact, people were complaining on I-40 because they were getting diverted and then causing traffic backups on I-40. Thermal runaway is the I saw that, that, is quote, the term. that, was, that was a great, that was a great quote. Yeah. And I, I actually saw it in some commentary. I don't know if you guys have seen the video where the man gets on the elevator with a an e-bike battery okay, the doors closed yes. and it immediately combusts and then the next shot is people waiting on the floor wherever the elevator is stopping and the doors open and 
it's pretty gruesome after that. I mean, it's like out of Terminator. I mean, you know, right? <laughs> well, they, they determined in the, in the I-15, uh, shutdown that, um, by trying to give an estimate of how long it was going to take to, to move the hazardous material out of the way and get the fire under control that they ultimately decided that it just needed to burn itself out. Right. At least that's, that's what I saw. And so these are the kind of high profile things, headline grabbing things that give you a little more pause as you think of, you know, having a complete overhaul of the nation's transportation infrastructure to support a lot more batteries, essentially moving up and down highways, et cetera. Forget, about, I, for, forget about all the other, right. the other when I, when I saw this, issues. this particular one, I thought it was interesting because right, it's, it's on I-15. It's not known for, you know, ample water, right? It's, so it's, it's already this dry region. So you know, just the, the idea of having to get all these trucks out there to try to cool, right? And you can't put these out. They're, you're just cooling them down so that they don't cause more damage, right? The amount of water and then where does that water go and what is in that water? Right. <laughs> this is not a typical house fire, right? This is toxic metal in water that's probably getting, I don't even want to know now, you know, and there's a lot of people who will say that, you know, that part of California gets what they wanted, but you know, right. whatever, I'm not going to say that, but insert our Midland Odessa. Yeah, right exactly. There, right. Ahead, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, you know, it's an, an interesting conundrum that, you know, not only are you having these horrible out of control fires, but even putting them out becomes a, just a, total nightmare. Um, yeah. and, and it's interesting. Um, somebody the other day was mentioning about getting on the Catalina express, the, the ferry that goes to Catalina, our friend, Mike, Umbra. yeah, Mike Umbra was saying that now if you do, it, it'll, they say, if you have an e-bike, you have to take the lithium battery off and hold it on your person. So that if it catches fire, you just throw it in the, in the ocean. Cause <laughs> they have no way to put good. it out. Yeah. Really? Yeah. The, and I'm uh, like, has this happened enough that they're like, Here's the best way to do this. We're going to need you to take this and just throw it in the ocean and just, we're just going to keep heading out. Well, and, and again, I don't want this to come off as, as anti lithium and all that. Cause God, I'd be lost without this. Yeah. Let's this not thing. talk about that. Yeah. But, but, but the whole deal is let's have an honest discussion about this. When we talk about environmental impacts, it needs to be in the uh, calculus. One, um, one stat I will throw up that I, throw out that I just calculated. So it's liable to be wrong, but you said 75,000 pounds of lithium battery that stores the same amount of energy as 250 barrels of oil. That's the difference. Cause it's about a barrel of oil weighs 300 pounds equals 200,000 uh, 20,000 pounds of lithium in terms of just theoretical hundred percent energy storage kilojoules or whatever you calculated in but uh i'm, I'm not going to argue that one I, I watched the gerbil turn the whole time chuck but Smoke I'll, okay yeah ears. but i'll yeah. okay yeah it's kind of uh it's kind of crazy the uh the other thing that was uh interesting is we had a a piece from nantucket where basically they had a wind power incident and things are starting to a walk wash up on shore yeah that one was a interesting one and what what a what a what an unfortunate coincidence that our nantucket resident staff bde member is is where is he i think he I was don't think we can say i don't think we can say he is not here but he's not here he is not here i think the bigger problem is that no none of us came up with a horrible limerick for this uh yeah. but, you know, but anyway <laughs> There once was a wind turbine from man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not even going to try, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's right. The, uh, and so, then so the, it seems that the beach closure for a single turbine failure have closures have persisted or did persist for much longer than, you know, some foam and some fiberglass and other things falling into the ocean and washing up on shore. Well, there's, there's oil that they're having to clean up from the turbine. I think they're finding that the fiberglass is starting to degrade quicker than they thought, right? So they're having to do a lot more cleanup. Um, but yeah, it's it's 
you know, offshore wind is, I don't know. It's an in- interesting proposal and, and it's, it's, you're seeing how when it goes wrong, it goes just as wrong as. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's this, you know, we've seen it. We've certainly seen it over the last 40 plus years with nuclear power. You know, you still, the, the political opposition is, is always colored by discussions of Chernobyl sure. and three, dot, three mile Island. So you have these single incidents and now where everything travels so quickly with photos and video and just our kind of political climate uh, globally. And certainly here in the U S you know, the, these things are certainly progress setbacks. Oh yeah. Because you, you just devolve into this um, gridlock of really serious policy making and, and certainly consideration of what works and what doesn't. Um, so it'll be interesting to, to see how quickly this all fades and when and if the next. I haven't kept up. Are they, are they going back into the rest of the turbines and having to do recompl? I mean, I'm, you know, the, the news that I've seen has only been on the cleanup and I'm like, okay, but there's a lot of other turbines out there. Like what are, are you making sure that this won't happen again? Is this an, a single failure incident? But you know, I'll be directionally right with this. Uh, I believe tax credits kick in at year 10 Mm -hmm. to refurbish blades and or replace blades. And the jury's out on whether you've actually hit economic payback at that point. At 10 years. At 10 years, you know. And so... And so that's part of the issue because ultimately we're just going to have a pile of these blades sitting around in, in junk piles. I mean, we'll figure out something to do. So is there an them. asset retirement obligation for windmills and offshore like there are offshore oil and gas? I, I don't know. know. I'm curious. I'm going to have to look into that. What's we, my, yeah, what's my ARO? Uh, yeah, yeah, it has a much higher NPV because of the shorter life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're talking about incentivizing maintenance, replacement, complete system overhaul in a decade or even 15 years, you've got, you've got real obligations that I think need to be accounted for. Well, I mean, just saying, right. So they, they, they just, what was this two months ago, they came out with new um, bonding issues for offshore guys. Right. So, depending on your credit rating, whether or not you have to put it, you know, so the bonds increase for offshore oil and gas producers. That's that, that happened. My question is, okay, did that happen for offshore wind guys? Cause some of these guys you've never even heard of who they are. And, and the idea is right. They're, they're going to build something up and then flip it to a big utility, right? Cause a lot of the utilities don't want to take the, the risk of building. They, right. They're fine with, okay, once you sell a 25 year PPA to, you know, Massachusetts, they'll, they'll grab it, but they, they don't want, they don't want to construct it. So who, who takes that on? I'm going well, to have to mark that down and look at that. What's interesting too, is out in the Gulf of Mexico, EMP guys, chain of title is responsible for all of it. Right. It, it is. Mean, yeah. For, for the upstream guys, it always goes back to who took the police yeah, ultimately. Yeah. yeah. And so everybody can get get hit all along the way. I wonder if they're doing that with wind farms as well. Which is why they've, yeah, why they've come out with these new rules saying, okay, if you're, you know, Chuck Yates oil and gas and you take out a lease, you know, you're going to need to put up a bond on like Exxon right. who's like, no, we're good for it. I got yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. No, because onshore, onshore, particularly with private lands, we were able at some point in the PSA process say say uh uh-uh, uh you take yeah, it yeah. all that's that's and right the, and it always got to the to the to the dumpy operator that could declare bankruptcy that's right offshore is never allowed no no to it boomerangs back and it'd be interesting to see what happens to the economics of suddenly you've got to post millions of dollars of of bonds I know, would imagine for, they've got to have wind. something right? I mean if you're, yeah. if you're but all right the fan base can write in and tell us about that or we can yeah. research it. We've got something to We've got get my to analysts do. to do. Yeah, 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 homework. Got something for AI to do. Uh, last thing before we jump into the finger of a week, shout out to uh, our good friend Mark Mills, who sent out a great tweet, the no-duh tweet. But uh, Read the tweet. Yeah. Uh, do you have it up? 
we have a we may have arrived at a permanent point in no duh land. Renewable output is air quotes volatile. Who knew? Yeah, and so uh, there's a piece that he was referring to where it's in the uh, Economic Times. We'll post the link along with the tweet, but basically talking about the just the the safety net of natural gas and what's really stark in terms of recent performance between say wind and that gas. If you look in the, in the article from the 1st of July to the 23rd, aggregate power generation from U.S. wind farms dropped by 78% from 57, a little over 57 gigawatts to just under 13 gigawatts. And if you look at what stood in the gap, it's natural gas. Um, that boosted from just under 218 gigawatts to over 275 gigawatts. Wow. And there was a, I guess, a uh, weather or climate situation where you've got just the inherent volatility in wind when it gets really hot in these high pressure systems, you don't have a lot of wind. So he's kind of pointing out that there's no real weaning off of or transition away from more reliable dispatchable power generation yeah. to support, you know, this, I think somewhat naive notion that we're going to be able to completely change out an entire energy system that is wholly dependent upon or critically dependent upon um, things that are just naturally, naturally var variable. Well, I mean, you definitely, you know, regardless of you know what the dispatchable type of power is, right. It needs to be dispatchable. And I think that's, that's the issue is that we just haven't gotten to a renewable system yet that can, you know, we can't turn the wind on. We can't turn the sun on. Right. You know, everybody's saying, you know, that our batteries are going to save us until they all catch on fire on I-15. But, you know, until that, that's supposed to be the, the dispatch, right? But we haven't got there. And until then, unfortunately, I mean, we're all consuming a lot of power, mm -hmm. more and more, right? So it's I, like- I think the crux issue is, <clears throat> at least as far as regulated utilities go, they get incentivized to grow the rate base i.e. their assets. Yes. And from a generation standpoint, you have much newer, so much higher or much earlier in their depreciable life, so much higher value, which then gets spread over the the ratepayer base after they make their revenue and rate case to the public utility commissions. At some point you bump up against, I think, a consumer or ratepayer tolerance level that you keep adding today without sufficient grid scale storage to back up the variability of things like wind and solar, you, you've got, I think this somewhat skewed motivation or an incentive to go out and just build a bunch of additional variable generation. Yeah. I mean, putting it in the rate base is the name of the game, right? Is it, yeah, you can put beautiful. art, you can put art and furniture in your office building in the rate base. That's right. Helicopters for uh, executives. Not that I ever worked you know, for one of those companies. Is, <laughs> is natural gas the ultimate answer of of kind of the the swing provider, the emergency dispatchable? You know, we'll see. Um, we've got a tremendous amount of regulatory inertia to overcome in nuclear, but what's you know what what's the right yeah. mix? But in the meantime, we're you know we're kind of showing the practical reality of this revolutionary pace of adding less reliable generation to the grid and the fact that you need a lot of the system to catch up the rest rest of the grid namely storage 
Will we get there? I, th- uh, I, I think we will at some point to a yeah. meaningful degree. It's just that politics are embedded in all of this and there is no long-term in politics. So as these incidents and events that we've been talking about keep cropping up, um, I think you're going to have, you're, you're going to have continued polarization on, on the, uh, on the political spectrum. And that's no good for, for anyone in that we have never, at least in my lifetime, ever gotten to a coherent, sound, fundamental energy policy. No, no, that's that. That goes without irrespective saying. of side of the no, aisle. That's, absolutely. But I think one thing you said made me think. You know, we were talking earlier about you know what's the energy mix, and you know people will show like in Texas all the massive amount of green energy that we've added, and but one of the things that to your point is when we show those and, and we have, right, we've added all this solar, all this wind, how much storage have we added? How much, you know, so it's like, that's great that you've added all this extra power, but if I can't use it, I, what's the point, right? I mean, well, and I, and I come back to, we can't even have an intellectually honest discussion about, Hey, we're going to have this generation that's renewable. It's better for the planet. Great. It's going to be less reliable. We're going to have to do things like turn your thermostat up to 85 degrees or 80 degrees when it's a really, really hot day and it's not very sunny. You know, right. that that's what I hate, that we can't be thoughtful. And Mark makes this point all the time, and it's a really good one. By the way, audience, we talked about having way more friction today, that we were going to yeah. be a lot edgier, and all we're doing is agreeing with each other. But mm. – you always make the point that science rarely enters into the discussion, that engineering expertise on what actually can be done never pops up in the political but discussion. But when's the last time an engineer's run for office and been a politician? So that, that maybe, yeah. that's a, maybe that's the problem. Yeah. yeah, I think I pointed out. And if they the, ever did, maybe they weren't good engineers. So maybe yeah. you, 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 got, you got one or the other. <laughs> Take the PUC, for example. I pointed this out a couple of weeks ago. We talked about the commission's makeup. You know, there's five commissioners, one of whom holds an engineering degree, and it's in chemical engineering. Yeah. You know, I, I think the just just the basic practical implementation issues and obstacles that have to be addressed, analyzed, and overcome in design and implementation are at least in terms of the leadership of some of these decision makers, the ultimate rule makers needs to have more kind of technical and analytical depth at the table. Yes. There are staffs in administrative agencies and commissions that are chock full of these people. And you brought up the, the uh, notion of the FERC being balanced from a, a partisanship standpoint. If you go look on the PUCs, Texas PUCs, or PUC Texas, look at their uh, their bios, they're all characterized as nonpartisan. Well, the governor appoints all of them. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. the yeah. PUC mm. commissioners. So um, you know, we'll I I think as people experience directly more pain of inconvenience or cost as we're going through these growing pains. I think the more interested they will get in being much more informed from a voting standpoint, I, I don't. As well as hopefully as educated consumers. I mean, cause if you vote with your pocketbook, uh, potentially, right. Potentially that would be great too. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think I, this, ignorance doesn't mean stupid. It's just, you, you just don't, you're, you're not, no. you're not aware. And, and yeah. until you get, some spark or catalyst that said, I want to, I really want to be, you know, let's take the case of an election on substantive policy where there are issues like this embedded in, I think the ongoing energy policy debate that you need to understand at a deeper level, what's really going on and what the feasibility of all this stuff is. Um, meanwhile, your, you know, the rates that show up on your, your bill, your electricity bill keep creeping <laughs> yeah. up for some That's reason. Right. Yeah. Or you have, extended outages because, you know, allegedly center point was saving money by not doing uh, distribution line maintenance. Yeah. 
So yeah. our number one fan of, v, of BDE, Vlad. Vlad is a police officer in Richmond, Texas, who Love I see it. every morning when I get coffee. He gives me detailed notes on what he liked about the podcast, what he didn't like the podcast. Avery, to catch you up on Vlad's stuff, basically he thinks Jake Corley's the worst co-host we've ever had. And they've gone back and forth. Wow. But okay. this morning when I was getting coffee, he demanded that we bring back Finger of the Week. So Jacob is busy making a Finger of the Week video, which he's going to cut in right here. Since we're bringing it back, we need to bring it back in full force. So we've got two Fingers of the Week. I'm going to Mark on the first Finger of the Week. Avery, you're doing the second Finger of the Week. So Mark, the first Finger of the Week goes to the Dodgers and I have no idea. I'm a fair weather baseball fan, but I got five texts this weekend from friends, including you, that basically said, screw the Dodgers. What, yeah, the, the Dodgers were in town um, this weekend for a three-game series. And, of course, the, the ghost of 2017 and how the Dodgers were cheated out of the World Series by the Astros sign stealing um, came up, started off – with a comment from Clayton Kershaw, who actually happens to be from Dallas, talking about seeing the the ring statue in front of Minute Maid Park for the 2017 ch uh, championship. You know, he just doesn't like coming here because it just dredges up all of those those unfortunate memories of of basically how the championship was stolen. Never mind the fact that they couldn't score any runs in Dodger Stadium and if you go look at it at his playoff line, it's it's let's just say it's not clutch over <laughs> over the span of his career. And so there's there's another kind of sub drama that's been running well well before this weekend series with um, a relief pitcher named Joe Kelly, who got into a bit of a a dust up with uh, Correa. Dust up being that he's got. This was a few years ago. Several people, players, teammates between him and Correa, and he's walking away, giving kind of the 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 droopy lower lip pouting sign. So he's he's kind of public en enemy number one to Astros fans when they they visit Minute Maid Park. The peak of the I think the back in your face was Saturday night when Bregman walked it off in the bottom of the ninth with a with a home run off of arguably their top reliever, Blake Trinan. So score one for the good guys. Yeah. And, and I'll just add a little color here. One, you know, you, you had the Red Sox get sanctioned for um, electronic sign, sign stealing back in, in 2018. Who did the Red Sox play and win their world series against? It was the Dodgers who is now one of the superstar Roster members of the Dodgers, it's Mookie Betts, who was on the Red Sox side in 2018 when they, I guess you could say, they stole the championship from the Dodgers. And if you go back as far as the late 80s, there's a picture from the Chicago White Sox who's on record as commenting about the fact that Tony La Russa's White Sox team assigned pitchers to sit in the manager's office and watch a video feed from the Comiskey Park uh, center field camera and flash a light next to the oh, Gatorade right. sign. So this stuff is, has been going on for a while and, and really the, the imbalance in the way major league baseball has treated. This is, is a podcast for another time. Well, mm -hmm. and I'll go old school, Mike Piazza. Tell me that guy didn't do steroids. Come on, <laughs> Dodgers. <laughs> All right, Avery. There's a second finger of the week, Southwest Airlines, lay it on us. So as a loyal Southwest Airlines fan, and you know that says a lot about me, but so they've decided or caved to Elliott management. They're going to go switch up from the get on, you know, ABC boarding, and they're, you're going to have to pick a seat now uh, ahead of time, just like every other airline. Supposedly, you know, that's, they did some, you know, survey 80% of the people that's what they wanted. I really actually don't believe that, but 
sure, whatever. I think that's just caving and they're going to supposedly add in some sort of business seating in the front, you know, um, not really happy. Uh, it'll be mainly, I will say this, what people forget about with Southwest, one of the greatest parts of taking Southwest is when I show up and I get there like five minutes before another flight that I'm not on. I'm like, can I get on that one? And they're like, sure, get on there. Just, they don't care. It's like, just get on a bus. Um, yeah, it's not luxury, but I'm not flying, you know, to, I'm not going to take a Southwest flight to Hawaii. Even though they do them. Um, but you know, so just, they're just changing up the whole thing. Now, supposedly they're going to keep, they're going to keep the, the bags fly free and all that crap. But now, uh, now it's just another cheap airline. Yeah. The, and, and the, the love of Southwest airlines, cause I, I used to have it too. Uh, Herb Keller, oh, yeah. the, the original CEO, was one, arguably the greatest marketer on the planet. Two, thing I loved about him is multiple times through the years, he would go work somebody else's job. He would go be a baggage handler. Right. He would work as a, uh, a stewardess. He wouldn't fly the planes because he couldn't do that. But truly, I think, was in touch. And his whole thing was always... Because when when he started it, they were going to go out of business because Braniff just cut the fares. That's right. We're going to run them out of business, and he just did an ad that said, "Wasn't life better after we came along to compete with Braniff? Don't let us go out of business." And people paid more for airline flights just to keep Southwest around. And so, uh, I, I I get the love for Southwest, but I feel like they've kind of lost that since a little, little urban life. legend about. Southwest in the early days. And I actually saw it when I was flying in and out of Dallas when I lived up there at Love Field. Why was gate one at Love Field always the uh, San Antonio departure? No idea. Because Herb never moved from San Antonio and was commuting from San Antonio to Dallas every week. And so the closest gate was gate one. That was the San Antonio departure. I love that. The, the 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 other story I loved is when they came up with the new name of their frequent flyer program. The lawyers just screwed up and didn't run the search properly, and it turned out a and I'll make these details up, but like a truck, small trucking company somewhere owned the rights to that and sued. And at some point, someone tells Herb we've been sued, blah blah, and he goes, "Oh my God, what happened? Did we do this? We screwed it up." He picks up the phone and he calls the owner of the trucking company. He says, hey, let's do this. Let's arm wrestle for the name. Wink, wink, <laughs> I'm going to lose. And uh, and the 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 loser has to donate a million dollars charity to the to the winner as well as, you know, the winner gets the name and all this. And they wound up having this boxing ring, arm wrestling, herb like, like smoking. Over the top of type it, of deal. I love over it. the top type thing. And Southwest lost. So they gave the million dollars to the charity. They changed the name. But the free publicity from that tripled the membership oh, of the absolutely. Flyer program. So just genius. Genius like that. And uh and to show you what a good guy the trucking company guy was he matched the million dollars to the charity. No way. Just, just like, Hey man, you handled this cool. So anyway, all righty. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Avery standing invite to come back anytime. We appreciate really it. appreciate you joining us. That was fun. Uh, if you liked the show, please subscribe, drop us comments. We, uh, we try to get back with, uh, those and peace out.